Okay, so um, adoption strategies. My strategy is let the family do the work. Um, <laughs> and how to, how to empower families to rehome their, their pets on their own. Um, there's a lot of um, emotion around this and uh, some difficulty as well, and um, also I think a shift in thinking that needed to happen for me to get to this place where um, I could help families and empower families really to, to move their friend into another home when they could no longer meet their needs. Um, now, Fido Love is focused on dogs because that's what I know the most. Um, I think a lot of what I have um, would apply to cats as well. Um, and eventually one day I may have a kitty love or uh, what were we saying, a meow love. <laughs> um, and I'd like to do that. So um, anyway, I will uh, advance here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, if you'll indulge me just a little bit, I want to tell you a little bit about my background and how I came to Fido Love. Um, I started out in 1999 up in Seattle as a foster family, and then I also um, worked with a number of local pet organizations, a real rural kind of volunteer um, community-based pet organization called Adopt-A-Pet, and then also a group called ShelterPet.org, and they founded the very first kind of pet finder, Dot com. So it was really in the early days of the internet, and a fellow named Dave something or other up in Seattle uh, had the vision that the internet should be the place for shelters to come in and help promote their pets and have a searchable online database. So in those early days, I'd go around at the dog parks with flyers and hand out um, flyers and say, hey, go find your new pet on shelterpet.com, so, or, or shelterpet.org. So that has now become adoptapet.com. Um, so that was in Seattle, and then I moved uh, down to Central Oregon, which is where I live now, and I worked with the local humane societies there, the Central Oregon Humane Society, and also the one in Redmond. And the reason I want to talk about this is because my, my thinking probably those first four, or five, six, seven years was a lot of frustration with people that were getting rid of their animals. Um, you see the worst of the worst. I know you guys have seen it. Um, and there's a lot of frustration around that. There's disgust, uh, there's contempt, um, there's irritation, and there's a lot of judgment. And so that was sort of my lens uh, for about the first five or six years of rescue, vo volunteering, uh, working with shelters, and also with uh, the rescue organizations. And it, you, there was this real negativity around that for me that um, always got in the way, I think, of helping the animals ultimately. So um, in 2010, so about five years ago, um, in Central Oregon, the former Humane Society of Redmond um, uh, became Brightside Animal Center. That's what they're known now as. And I put this, this gal here, Chris Bowersfeld. Um, I started volunteering with them in 2010. I joined their board. I started their dog walking program. I basically did not have a real job then, so that became my job. So I was at the shelter probably about 40 or 50 hours a week working with Chris. And um, she opened my eyes to um, the people who surrender their pets and where they're coming from. And I was working really hands-on with these folks um, and seeing where they were coming from. And Redmond, I don't know if any of you have, are familiar with Central Oregon, but Redmond is really impoverished. Um, well, it has been. It's gotten better, but really low e eco economic, um, not a lot of education. Um, so you kind of see the kind of the worst of the worst in people. Um, and Chris, she marshaled through it every time. She was compassionate. She was caring. She always focused on the animal. I'm going to tear up. She always focused on the animal and not the issue. Not the, not, she didn't put judgment into why is this family here? Oh, they've been breeding this dog over and over and over again, and now this dog has a problem, and they're coming to us and asking for free surgery. She never went there. It was always about the animal. And I realized how powerful that was in helping the animals was to get over my judgment of the people and the individuals because ultimately if somebody isn't caring for their dog properly it's probably because they don't know how it's because maybe they're not caring for themselves very well um, it's because they probably had a bad start in their life and they just don't know any better 
Um, I know there's really extreme examples that it's really hard not to get angry um, and upset when you see what happens to these poor animals in our care. But um, for the most part, people, people generally mean well, um, but they're just not really with the program. So, um, so Chris really shifted my thinking about um, not judging why people were getting rid of these animals um, and got me over that hump. <clears throat> So I had new, new emotions around surrender and people um, getting rid of their animals. Um, so my focus now is about the animal. Again, not about the human being or the individual. It's really about problem solving and support and not contempt. And this is where Fido Love uh, started coming about. Um, I also struggle with this too. Um, and I know that m maybe this is something that um, is preached where you work or volunteer, um, but I think that this has caused a lot of guilt. It's caused a lot of hardship for families. It's caused a lot of unhappy animals because families keep the dogs or cats in their home when they really shouldn't be there, um, when the animals aren't thriving. We all have circumstances, I have them myself, where we're in transition and life becomes difficult and we can't find a way to work through it and our animals aren't getting the best from us and we're not able to meet their needs. And yeah, there's some people, they'll move mountains to keep their animals with them. They have that bond, it's so strong. But I think to guilt somebody that they should be doing this and keeping an animal in their home when it's not in the best interest of their animal and they're not able to provide for that animal is um, it's not helping the situation. It's not helping the animal any. So I, I, you know, I probably used to use this term, the forever home. I don't use it anymore because I, you know, sometimes homes aren't forever. And, and I really think that dogs and cats, probably dogs more so than cats, but they adapt um, as long as their basic needs are being met. I mean, these are the, probably the most adaptable animals there are to be around people in new situations. As long as their basic needs are being met, they move on and they, they bond with new people very quickly. Um, this is what happens. It's, you know, they, this, the dogs that have been on Fido Love, they've been stuck out in the backyard because they're maybe nipping at the kids. And... Uh, dangerous around the kids, and the dog was fine before. But, you know, we're not going to ask the, the family to give up their kids. That's not even an option. So what happens is we guilt them into the forever home, and I need to hang on to this animal, and they end up stuck out here for 24 hours a day. Um, or they end up destroying the furniture, or they end up just not an integral part of the family. So um, with Fido Love, I really wanted a place where people could come and um, be supported, not be judged, um, have guidance and support, um, respect in, in a courteous environment. So the website is a platform for families to meet. Again, it's mostly, it's dog oriented right now, um, but hopefully that will change. Um, a lot of the reasons that dogs end up in shelters have nothing to do with the behavior of the dog. It's more about the situation of the family. I think my experience has been about 50 to 70% of the time that's the case. I'm not saying Fido Love or rehoming directly is appropriate for every person or, excuse me, for every animal. I think sometimes dogs need that help and that behavior training and they need structure and consistency. And that's where a shelter organization like Brightside can do that. Um, I launched uh, the website in 2012, so it's for people who want to adopt a dog and for people who want to rehome the dog. Um, and I'm getting about 5,000 visitors a month right now, which is mostly in Oregon, um, and it's just coming from a variety of different places. Um, my real aspiration is to get it in the hands of more no-kill shelters, people who really want to reduce the incoming population help their save numbers, um, and um, just keep the animals out of the shelter in the first place, particularly when they're uh, well taken care of and they're fine and they don't need help or behavioral training. <clears throat> so who's on Fido Love? This is a screenshot of all the dogs that are on the website right now. Um, Bruce Wayne is in my home right now. He's a corgi, uh, corgi basset hound. Bulldog Terrier mix, and he's like the coolest dog ever. 
his feet go like this, and um, our local shelter actually was going to put him down. Um, so we pulled him out. <laughs> And they have a very, I was talking with Linda earlier, um, they have a very low threshold for, um, for when they decide to kill an animal. Um, so he's with me. And then all of these dogs, uh, Finn, Dakota, and um, Belle are uh, families with new kids, and the dogs aren't getting the attention they need. Um, Mo and Shelby, are, they have six. Sick families, sick family members, they no longer can meet their dog's needs. They have terminal uh, conditions in the family. So um, their uh, parents with young, young kids, they're the, the folks who are moving, can't take their animals with. Um, dogs are too much for them. We see a lot of mismatches with dogs where they come from one family and they're hor horrible um, uh, match. Um, for whatever reason, and um, so you get that dog in a new home, and they do great, and they thrive, as you guys know that. Um, so when they're coming to Fido Love, there's a lot of emotion, and this is probably really unique um, to what, you guys, what the shelters aren't experiencing necessarily um, by the time that, that you adopt out a dog. Um, with Fido Love, the family's coming in, um, they're in a high emotional state. They've got a lot of adjustment. Um, and so we need to work with them in the most open, embraceive, guiding, positive way that we can. And again, leave the judgment outside, which is really hard to do sometimes. And I always have to keep reminding myself that I can't judge the person. I need to just work with the situation and find a solution um, when I get in those places. I have to remember to be kind. So. Um, for folks who want to rehome their dogs, they create a FIDO profile. It's an online ad. You guys are welcome for the, for the folks who are doing dog rescue. Linda, um, you're welcome to use FIDO Love any time to get, you know, just as another venue. Um, we specifically, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but we, this is not for shelter organizations that have animals in a kennel environment. I really want the animals to be in a home environment because we know the, the, that things change and you don't really see the animal's true nature, I think, when they're in the shelter environment. So um, we, they create an ad. Um, they then we help them to evaluate the families that come in to the website. Um, and then we also encourage them to uh, put paperwork in place for um, adoption, a rehoming agreement, and then also uh, provide support to the family that adopts. And also make sure that, um, that it's been discussed, what if this doesn't work out, will you take the dog back? And make sure that you set expectations for uh, what kind of communication you want to have on the back end of the adoption. So the challenges that, that I see on the website, because I'm monitoring it, moderating it every single day, are um, this, um, which I know that Cara and Heather are going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and I'm, I'm sure if you're working on the adoption marketing side of your organizations, um, writing a compelling description is really tough. And if you've never done it before, it can really suck. Um, so we get horrible descriptions sometimes and re really need to do a lot of work on that. Um, photos can be really awful. Um, so that's a constant struggle for me is how to get better photos for our rehomers that come on. Um, we also sometimes, you know, if folks are homeless or maybe don't have a, you know, good financial um, resources, they might not even have a computer. It makes it really difficult. So. I'm trying to, to move the website more on phone, um, have it be more accessible on mobile. Um, but that's always, that's always a challenge. I had a gentleman contact me about a year and a half ago. He was um, in Oregon City, a veteran, and um, he was without his dog, and his dog was in Bend with a person who was helping him out. And he didn't have a, a computer, and he kept calling me saying he needed help um, to adopt out his dog. He couldn't care for his dog. He was going to be in the veteran's home for a year, convalescing or, or fixing whatever ailed him. And um, anyway, that, so that was one example. We ended up um, getting he, him reunited with the dog. This is not really a fight or love thing, but it was kind of my own thing. 
um, he got reunited with his dog and was able to keep it as a companion animal at the Veterans Hospital. And he's like ever grateful guy. He's just, it's a great story. Anyway, um, so sometimes they don't have the technology. They don't have the marketing experience. So there's a, a, a tendency sometimes when people are putting their animal online when they're marking their own animal to overdo the negative. They want to be really forthcoming. They want to make sure that there's no surprises. But they don't realize that you really don't want to um, say over and over again that your dog would be just great if only. You know, that, that happens a lot. So um, anyway, that's another one of my challenges. And then the other is just timely um, communication between the families, making sure that if one family is posting their dog for adoption and another family makes an inquiry, I want to make sure that they are quickly corresponding with one another so the frustration doesn't set in. So I'm constantly nagging at people to communicate better. Um, I do have folks register to use the site. Um, and so um, that tends to put sort of a threshold um, in place so that people are really serious about wanting to use it. And um, I've learned some tricks along the way to make sure that we only have serious adopters and serious rehomers on the website and just get better quality experiences. Um, so, so how I overcome some of these solutions for folks who want to rehome their dog on their own through the site um, is I have form fill questionnaires um, and also um, I'll show you an example. I have a formulaic narrative that I lead people through and that's really helped a lot um, with the poor descriptions. Um, I also will reach out to folks and ask them for better photos and coach them and guide them. I'd like to one day maybe think about having PetSmart or one of the big agencies that has many locations um, get their employees to take photos for us, um, perhaps. Um, some way to just get better photos overall um, is a goal of mine. Um, technology, again, we're, um, I'm doing email, phone support, and then also text messaging. Um, and then uh, how to guides how to create great descriptions um, and more email support uh, and advice. And then also this timely communication. So um, doing more by phone is really, I think, where it's at. Um, these are kind of the, the key steps along the ways. Uh, in the marketing part, the form fill, um, what's the reason for rehoming, um, what are the personalities of the dog. I'll show you an example. Um, because I, I feel like when people adopt a dog, and probably to a cat to some degree as well, um, they're, in a way, they're kind of adopting an experience. Um, and so the way I think of it is, I want a dog so I can go to the dog park. Or I want a dog to cuddle up with at the, you know, while I'm eating popcorn on my couch. Or I want a dog to go travel with me and explore and be my adventure buddy. I want a dog to go running with. So they have this role for the animal that they see and they perceive. And so... Oops, I did that by accident, but I wanted to go there. So, so what I've done is created um, 10 different, I call them phytotypes, but it's really more about the individual and how they envision having that animal in their life. I want a dog that's just going to hang out next to the window and be chill, and I'm not going to have to housebreak it. Um, so I've tried to make that like a quick way. If you can't come up with a great description, it's a quick way to go in and say, you know, this is how what kind of dog I think how my dog would do well in your home. Um, and then families that are looking to adopt, they also, they have this, um, and they know what they want in their minds. I think there's, we all kind of have a type of dog that we're drawn to, and cat, same way. Um, so this is just a tool on the website that I've used for uh, our rehomers or adopters. This is my formulaic narrative. I'll be honest, I stole it from somewhere, and I loved it. Um, so, and this has just been fantastic. It's, it's positive, it's upbeat, it's, um, it gives eno enough information, but, you know, like this, it's like, that's it, that's the negative. I would rather not do, you know, X. Um, so it, it gives enough structure and of a framework that it gets the information, the important information about the dog, but it also doesn't, it, it, Having that framework means you're not going to repeat yourself over and over again about what's bad about the dog. And usually the things that are bad about the dog um, don't, aren't bad in a new home environment is what I found. Um, 
I'm really, really, really big on checking references. So this is when you're evaluating uh, the homes, the inquiries that come in. I have a seven-step process. I find that having steps is comforting for people. Um, of course, every situation you need to use judgment um, as to whether or not it's appropriate. But um, this is like my big step. I keep hitting people over the head over and over and over again. And I know for myself even, um, it can be hard checking references. You feel like you're intruding on the adoptive family. Um, and it's, it's uncomfortable, um, but it's so important. So if there's anything I do with Fight Love in the future, it's going to be having a better way for families to do this where either um, we're taking that burden off of them, the burden without the liability, um, but then um, also maybe initiating the first um, inquiry, like sending an email out automatically to the, their vet or their doggy daycare or, so, or a personal reference so that we can take some of that off of the rehomer's plate. But um, yeah, checking references for me is huge, especially when you've never done this before and there's a lot of emotion around it. Um, another tool, <laughs> this is my poor design skills. <laughs> um, <laughs> is just setting the new family up for success. So I do try to encourage rehomers to think about um, how that dog's experience is going to be in the new home and what ways can they support that. Um, I feel like um, two weeks is sort of the window when you know whether things are going to work or not work. That's kind of been my personal ex experience. Um, and so I do tell rehoming families, you know, to be prepared for it up to two weeks that that could be the point when you find out that this dog's just not a good fit or it's not going to work with other animals in the house or kids or what have you. Um, but this is something that the rehomer actually would provide to the adopting family. Um, and I'm trying to provide more support for the adopting family. Um, uh, the pro promotional platform, when somebody uh, adds their uh, FIDO profile to the website, um, we send an, a, an email blast out to the adoptive families. So I've got a list of anywhere from 500 to 600 adoptive families right now, a really current list of people who are looking to adopt. So I'll put the dogs on there. Um, I also um, use social channels a lot. Um, Google Plus, if you're not using it, it's kind of understated and um, a lot of people don't use this kind of a hassle, but Google Plus actually can be an incredible um, uh, tool. It has been my experience. Cara, I don't know if you have the same, but um, getting found in search engines by using Google Plus is something that a lot of folks don't know about. Um, so anyway, if, if you're the one kind of creating pet finder profiles or profiles on your website for your animals, um, and you're already using Twitter or Facebook, I would definitely use Google+. Um, I don't use Instagram so much because it's kind of a younger audience, and I actually don't like my, my dogs to go with younger families. Um, I, it's basically families in transition, which is the heart. If I know a family's planning to have kids in two years, it's like, e, you know, just try to think about retired couple, young retired couple that likes to travel a lot. Like, that's my perfect dog adoption family. Um, Chris, you're not always that lucky. And some dogs actually need a younger, a younger family to keep up with them. But anyway, um, and then website SEO, uh, this is what I, this is an area that I specialize in. So um, for, my, for my paid job during the day. Um, so uh, learning ways that when you build out those profiles that you can put certain keywords or Say, for example, the dog I showed you that I'm fostering right now, he's an English Bulldog Terrier. Those are very popular dogs. They're hard to find. So when I write up his profile, I make sure that I use that word in the page a lot online. That helps him to get found if somebody's looking for that kind of dog, possibly. That helps a little bit. Um, so website traffic of 5,000. Um, in general, for my profiles, um, they get anywhere from 150 to about 300 views before they get adopted. Some dogs get way more if they have great photos or they're a popular breed. The, they can get bombarded. I had a, um, an, what was it, a, a mini Aussie go on the website a couple weeks ago, and within one day she had 15 inquiries. 
and it was actually really a problem <laughs> because they all want to know about this dog, and and so I have, I've again, I moderate and just make sure that people know, you know, she got a lot of inquiries, so you need to be patient. She needs to work through this. Um, but generally, about 150 to 300 views each dog, and then. Um, anywhere from two to three inquiries a week. It's not as high as I would like. Hopefully, I'll get better and better at that with my marketing and more as Fighter Love gets known. Um, and then, in, uh, on average, it takes about two to five weeks to get dog adopted, uh, successfully adopted through the website. Um, so, about 50% of the dogs coming into Fighter Love um, get rehomed through Fighter Love. The other 50%, um, sometimes people change their mind. Um, sometimes they end up surrendering them at a shelter, um, so, and they just get impatient. Um, and um, other times they just have found a family friend or a neighbor. So just some uh, housekeeping items. Um, dogs in the home setting. Not, this is not for people who have dogs in the kennel. We really want to see the true personality of the dogs. Um, I don't allow commercial postings, as you guys can appreciate and probably understand. Um, I'm really vigilant about that. Um, I also have been cracking down on unfixed un pit bulls, um, especially when they're crazy and they have you know, a $300 rehumming fee and they're not fixed, and so I'll just shut them down. They don't even go on the site. Um, and then I also require the families to correspond within one to two days. I kind of monitor that. I have a way of monitoring it. And if they don't, I'll, I'll pull them off because I just I want to keep that correspondence going. Um, there are some other things, too, on the website as well that I want to make sure families have available. Um, one is that, you know, what if there's multiple inquiries? The other thing is geographic distance. It becomes much harder when you don't know what you're doing adopting your dog out. And maybe you have an adoption between Portland and um, Ashland, which is something that happened Back in January, they wanted a 300-hour rehumming fee. It was a Labradoodle that um, was canine companion trained, so it was really well socialized dog. The family in Ashland paid $300 to adopt the dog, two-year-old um, golden doodle, and within two weeks, they found out that the dog was out doing well with their young son. And the family in Portland agreed to take the dog back, but had already spent the rehumming fee. So, um, so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to resolve those or at least have folks go in with their eyes wide open. I don't recommend a 300 hour rehumming fee in general. Um, and then bringing Fido home, what to expect, taking great photos. And then also I, I want to have resources for people who want to keep their dogs. I don't want them rehoming their dog if it's not appropriate. So if they're coming on because they think that they can't find any other options for moving, I want to give them some great ideas. I've been there where you're trying to get a rental home and you've got to figure out a way to convince the landlord that you're going to be a great tenant. Um, so we've actually got a lot of resources for people who actually may want to keep their animal on there um, and encourage them to do that if they're not ready to rehome. So um, that's it. We're re-rolling re out Fighter Love um, next month. And um, it will be a bigger, broader platform um, available uh, to all states in the United States. It's just been local. And so hopefully you'll see more of us as time goes on. So.